Great. So thank you so much, Chris, for inviting me. Um, I think thank you all for coming, too. I'm really excited to be here. So I'm a second year PhD student at Stanford, and I work with Dan Bonet. And um, I'm going to talk today about public key crypto in the NSA. Um, so since Chris mentioned that uh, not everyone here may be familiar with, with public key crypto or crypto in general, I'm going to spend the first part of the talk giving a little bit of a technical history to sort of explain what was going on in the 70s that was so controversial and exciting. Um, and, and why people care and why we should care now. And then in the second part of the talk, I'll give a little bit of the political history. So what exactly happened in the 1970s um, that, that sort of changed the course, I would say, of, of crypto research in the US? Um, so my first task, which is uh, you know, uh, sort of difficult, is to summarize 5,000 years of crypto in, in about 20 minutes, uh, which is what I'm going to do now. So, so for the first 5,000 years of crypto, basically until the 70s, um, crypto was really about one problem. The problem was to protect military and diplomatic communications in transit. And you had to do this with very few computing tools. So basically you had a pen and paper and that was it. And you also had very few mathematical tools. So there wasn't really good, uh, good ideas about how to analyze the security of a cipher or how to reason about uh, how much work an adversary would have to do to break a cipher. So, so again, military and diplomatic communications are really what crypto is about. Um, so the, the, the application you can have in mind maybe is a queen and a general want to communicate. Um, so what they do is the queen and the general meet in the palace. They agree on some secret passphrase that's going to be their secret key. And then the general goes out into the battlefield uh, somewhere far away. And so the queen and the general now can only communicate by couriers uh, who they don't really trust. So the courier might read the messages that the queen is sending to the general, and, and they want to prevent this from happening. Right? So maybe the queen wants to say to the general, you should attack at dawn, but doesn't want to leak this information to the courier. Um, so what she can do is she can encrypt the message with, with her key uh, into some cipher text that just looks like garbage if you don't know what the secret key is. And then she sends the message using this un, sort of partially trusted courier to the general, who can then decrypt it using, uh, using the secret key. Right? So this is secret key cryptography. And of course, the security property that you want is if the courier is listening in, he doesn't learn what the battle plan is. Uh, even if, even if he gets to read all the messages. So what are some examples of, of, of sort of old school cryptography? Uh, if you haven't seen these before, I thought I'd mention one or two just because they're sort of fun. Um, this is a Spartan device that was, uh, that was used for this sort of communication. And the way it worked, there was a, a wooden rod and then a strip of leather that's wrapped around the rod. So the way you encrypt with this thing is you have the rod here uh, and you write garbage letters, just random letters along the length of the rod except in one row where you write the message that you want to encrypt. Okay, so you write garbage everywhere else. And then when you pull the leather strip off, right, you get the ciphertext that looks like, you know, looks like garbage if you don't know to look in every, every fifth position. Um, so, so you're sort of reading along the, the, the width of the rod instead of the length. Um, so here, I guess the secret is, is the diameter of the, of the stick. So if you don't know the diameter of the stick, presumably it's hard to recover the message if you uh, if you're just reading, reading the, the piece of leather that's stripped off. And you could get fancier maybe if you, you vary the diameter of the stick along the length or something like this, you could make it slightly harder to decrypt. Um, but clearly this is, not, this is not the sort of cipher you would use today because it's, it's not so hard to break. Um, so what's another example of the sort of codes that people were using um, you know, in early, early cryptography? This is, this is a book that you can get in the library um, that has the US diplomatic codes and ciphers from about the you know, 18th to early 20th century. And diplomatic codes uh, for most of history uh, look sort of like this. So there's this big code book that's the size of a dictionary. And for basically every English word, there's a corresponding code word. So maybe above is encrypted as GI. Um, so, so the person who's going to encrypt the message at the embassy sort of goes through the, the message. And for each, each word in the message, looks up the corresponding code word and then sends that out on the, on the telegraph, say. Um, so the code book here is the secret key. Um, so, so the embassy and, the, and headquarters share, share the code book. So this, this uh, sort of prehistoric cryptography, or I guess very old cryptography, there were, there were basically two main problems that you had to solve, or two, two main problems that kept coming up um, with crypto systems like these. So the first problem was security, meaning that nobody really knew what a secure cipher would look like. Um, nobody really knew, say, if you had two different code books, which one was going to give you a better cipher than the other. That, that was, there's not really the, the tools that you need to understand that. Um, and the second problem, which was potentially even more uh, annoying for people actually trying to deploy these things, was the problem of key distribution. 
So think about um, the task of distributing these code books to all of the US embassies and consulates around the world. Right? So there's hundreds of them. Um, they all need a copy of the code book. And if one of those code books gets stolen, all of a sudden, all of your communications everywhere in the world are compromised. So what do you do? You basically destroy all the code books, print a new batch of code books, ship the code books from DC to all the embassies, and hope that another one doesn't get stolen on the way. Right? Because if another one gets stolen, you have to start over. So this key distribution problem um, is really, really annoying for people who are trying to do crypto in the real world. Um, and even worse, I mean, basically the, the way people would break crypto systems is, is rarely, I mean, sometimes they would attack the, the cryptography directly, but it's much easier to just steal the keys, right? So when the code book is in transit on the boat from DC to uh, Manila, you just, you know, somehow get on the boat and look at the code book. Um, but I'd like to talk about the first problem here uh, just briefly. So in 1949, um, Claude Shannon, who was a, an information theorist, uh, the first information theorist, and he was also a scientist at Bell Labs, had this really nice, uh, really nice idea, a really nice question that he asked, which was, what does an ideal cipher look like? So if we were going to design you know, from first principles a cipher that, that was as strong as possible, what would that, what would that be? Um, and sort of surprising was he actually concluded that a cipher that people already knew about actually satisfied sort of the strongest notion of security that you could ever want. Um, so this is, this is the crypto system called the one-time pad um, that you may have heard of. And it provides uh, perfect secrecy in the sense that an adversary with unlimited computational power, unlimited time, um, unlimited CPU cores, whatever, still can't break, uh, still can't learn anything about the message that he didn't know already by looking at the ciphertext. Um, so Shannon showed that this system called the one-time pad has this property. Um, so that was sort of the good news of, of Shannon's work is that if you, you're willing to, to use the one-time pad, you can get this amazing property that uh, an infinitely powerful adversary can't break your system. Um, so that was the good news. What was the bad news? So th there are a couple pieces of bad news. The first piece of bad news is that the one-time pad is, in fact, the only crypto system that has this property. So if you want this sort of security, you basically have to use the one-time pad. Um, the second piece of bad news is that the one-time pad is extremely inefficient in terms of keying material. Um, so basically, if you want to encrypt an n-bit message with the one-time pad, you need n bits of keying material. Um, so you can think of a shared key between the queen and the general. Um, and, and even worse than that, you actually have to change the key with every message that you're sending. So, so the reason it's called the one-time pad is because you get to use the key once, and then you have to throw it away and get a new key. Um, so, so I'll come back to that in a second. But first, I should say, um, if you can't read this, it says, don't try this at home. So this is actually a even though it's sort of theoretically secure, this is never a crypto system you would use on a computer in practice today, um, even though some people do. So if someone you know is using this, tell them you, know, you should run away uh, from, from whatever system they're building. So the interesting thing about, about uh, Shannon's paper, though, is that all of a sudden, basically, many, many people started using the one-time pad um, a, in the 40s and 50s. And, and so this is an example of a one-time pad keying material. Um, and this is actually some Soviet keying material. And you can see it's just a, a large sheet of random numbers. Um, so you would use this sheet of random numbers to encrypt some message that maybe you're sending from an embassy back to, uh, back to the Soviet Union. Um, and the one-time pad was actually really popular. It was used um, to encrypt the hotline that was set up between the White House and the Kremlin after the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, it was used to encrypt Soviet diplomatic traffic. Um, and it was used in a bunch of other, a bunch of other scenarios, um, so really widely used because of this nice uh, security property that it provides that no other cipher does. Um, but, but again, sort of back to the problem of key distribution or, or key management, what happens with the one-time pad um, if you run out of keying material? So the queen and the general are communicating using the one-time pad, and oh, they, they ran out of key, you know, the, the bit string that they, they were using is their key, you know, they ran out of bits, what happens? Or if you reuse keys, so maybe the queen screwed up and encrypted two different messages with the same key. Uh, or maybe if the random, you know, the keys are supposed to be random. What if the keys are not as random as you thought they were? So there's some bias in the random bits. What happens? Uh, you know, basically catastrophic failure of the crypto system happens. Um, so in particular, there's this project um, called the Venona Project that was happening in the U.S. And it turned out that, that Soviet diplomats were using um, basically the, the factory in the Soviet Union that was producing one-time pad keys uh, was trying to economize. So they were sending the same one-time pad keys to different embassies. And I, I imagine that the guy in the factory was sort of hoping that nobody would notice. Uh, but it turns out, like, 
someone was clever enough to realize that this was going on and was able to decrypt a huge amount of traffic just because of this, this problem. So, so you know, one-time pad really means one time. It doesn't mean like one and a half or like, uh, you know, don't, don't save money that way. All right, so just to emphasize, when the queen and the general are communicating, the queen gets to send one message using this shared key. And then if, let's say on Tuesday, uh, she wants to send a new message, they need to agree on some new key and then send, you know, send the next message and, and so on and so forth. So, so, uh, right. so this raises the obvious question, like, where do you get the keys? Like, where do you get all this keying material? Um, so, so going back to the two problems of crypto before 1976, I said the two problems were security and key distribution. So the one-time pad is like a really beautiful answer to the first question. It gives you perfect secrecy. But now all of a sudden, the second question is like way worse, right? Because now you don't just need a short key. You need massive amounts of key. Uh, you know, uh, your, your keys need to be gigabytes long, potentially, if you want to send gigabytes of data. Um, so that sort of brings me, you know, that was, that was 5,000 years of cryptography. And now I want to talk about what's going on right here. Um, sort of what's happening in, in the 1970s. So what's happening in the 1970s, of course, uh, so, so just to go back to what I said earlier, military applications before the 1970s were driving interest in cryptography. Um, but in the 70s, uh, we see, you know, business applications for crypto were, were, you know, coming up. And the reason, well, there's like one application that got everyone worried first. Um, Maybe does anyone, can anyone take a guess at like what's the first application of computers that got people thinking about crypto and commercial applications? Like, fine, right, so, so ATMs uh, was the first thing where people said, holy cow, like we're sending you know, unencrypted data that's not authenticated at all over, these, over telephone lines. What if some bad guy you know, is able to manipulate the telephone lines and cause the ATM to spit out cash? Uh, so you know, this, is, this is my connection to Ethereum for the, for the talk. Uh, <laughs> no, so it all comes back to it all comes back to, to currency in the end. Uh, but but another, I mean, you could ask, well, why why are ATMs such a bad? You know, why does this make the problem so difficult? Like, why why couldn't we use secret key crypto systems with ATMs? Um, so you can imagine, right? There's a, an ATM and it's talking to a bank. Um, why doesn't the bank just refill the keys in the ATM when it refills the money? You could sort of imagine a world in which that happened when the ATM has some tape of keying material. When it runs out of tape, some guy from the bank just goes and refills it. And you could, you could definitely do that. Um, the problem is that the world doesn't really look like this with ATMs and banks, right? There's actually sort of a gajillion banks and, and billions of ATMs. OK, not that many, but still a lot. And you know, if you're in Japan using an ATM, you'd like it to be able to talk to your bank in California. And you'd like that connection to be encrypted. Um, so if you sort of naively applied standard crypto techniques up, up to this point, you'd have a world where every bank needs to share keys with every ATM. And all of a sudden, now the key distribution problem is like much, much worse, right? Because not only do you need to agree on lots of keying material, everyone who wants to talk to everyone else needs sort of a pairwise shared key. So in general, key distribution in decentralized networks is really difficult. Um, and it gets more difficult when you're talking about something, uh, something like the internet, where there's mutually distrusting parties uh, maybe who've never communicated before, and they want to agree on some shared secret. So, so again, it, th these two problems of crypto, security and key distribution, the key distribution issue gets worse and worse as, as the networks get larger, as they get more decentralized. Um, so enter this guy named Ralph Merkel. Um, has, it, can, can, uh, does, has anyone heard of Ralph Merkel? Can I get like a show of hands? Oh, good. Have you heard of him for, for Merkel trees? Yeah. OK, what about Merkle Key Exchange? Oh, good. Yeah, so, so Ralph Merkel was an undergrad at UC Berkeley in the 70s. Um, and he asked this question that's sort of counterintuitive. So he, so he asked the question, uh, can two parties agree on a shared secret without any private communication whatsoever? So uh, I, don't, I don't know about you, but this, this doesn't seem possible to me sort of at first glance, right? So, so imagine the queen and the general again. Um, they're communicating with this courier, and the courier is trying to read the messages. And the queen and the general want to agree on a shared secret, but they have no private communication channel. So the, the courier is reading all the messages, and you want to agree on a shared secret. So, so how, how can you do this? Um, and again, the application here, of course, that we care about is, is how you do this over the internet or over a, a large network, something like this. Um, and the amazing thing uh, that Merkel did, even as an undergrad, is he had, he, had, he had an idea for how to implement this. 
Um, so his idea is as follows. Um, Alice and Bob here are going to be, say, the queen and the general, wanting to agree on a shared secret. And he constructed a protocol such that Alice and Bob just needed to do linear work to agree on the shared, uh, the shared secret that they're going to use to encrypt the rest of their messages. But the eavesdropper, who's the courier in this case, is going to have to do much more work, so like n squared work, to learn what that secret is. So somehow you cleverly design the protocol such that the, you know, the right people do a little work and the bad people do, uh, you know, the wrong people do lots of work. And so if you, if you think of n as like 2 to the 30, like a billion operations, a billion is sort of feasible, but a billion billion, you know, n squared is, is less feasible. You know, a billion you can do on your laptop, 2 to the 60 is not, uh, not something you're going to be able to do easily on your laptop. Um, so I thought it would be fun, uh, just because this is not a very well-known protocol, just to sketch it. Uh, and if it goes over your head, don't, don't worry about it. Um, so basically, the way it works um, is that the queen and the general, again, are trying to agree on their shared secret, but only using public communication channels. So what, how it works is uh, Alice, who's the queen here, picks big n different numbers in the range from 1 up to n squared. So n is some, some constant that we pick uh, ahead of time. And she publishes the hashes of these numbers. So she publishes hashes of x1 up to xn. Um, and she gives these to the courier, and he takes them over to the, to the general. Um, so the general here does the same thing. So he picks a bunch of numbers, y1 to yn. And you know, they're in the, some range that we've picked cleverly. And this, is just, this h here is just a regular hash function. So you can think of like SHA-256 or something. Um, and so the, the, the thing that happens if we pick n correctly um, is that basically one of these values is going to be the same. So Alice, when she sees Bob's list of hashes, is going to say, aha, Bob's y4 is the same as my x2. So Bob and I can use uh, x2, which is the same as y4, as our shared secret. So you know, just, just because Alice sees uh, his hash matches my hash, we can use, we can use whatever the preimage of that hash is as our shared secret. Um, so why is, this, why is this secure? Like, Why does the eavesdropper not also learn the shared secret? So the eavesdropper sees all this information. He sees both lists of hashes. And he can identify that this is the one that he has to attack. So he has to learn what x2 is. But the problem is he doesn't, ha he doesn't know anything about x2, except it's a number between 1 and n squared. So he basically has to do n squared work to recover, recover the secret key. And this is, this is just using a hash function, right? There's no fancy uh, sort of advanced crypto here at all. And this, to me, is, is you know, beautiful and surprising uh, and wonderful that he could do this as an undergrad. So what he did, and I think Merkel was, was surprised also, so he wrote it up for his undergrad project in you know, CS244, Computer Security at Berkeley. And you know, Berkeley professors are not you know, quite as sharp as Stanford professors, I guess. And the, the professor says, you know, so this was project one. He says, well, project two is better. Like, this doesn't, you know, your description is sort of muddled. Yeah, I'm not sure it's going to work. Talk to me after class. Um, and in fact, the, the professor, I mean, the, I feel bad for the professor, right, because he really missed out also. And to be fair, it wasn't written up. It's not written up very clearly. Um, and I, I'll post the slides later, but you can, you can actually go and read the project proposal. And it's not so clear what's going on. Um, but fortunately, this idea wasn't lost to history because uh, Merkel actually emailed um, this professor at Stanford, Martin Hellman, uh, who had been working on similar problems. He was an assistant professor at the time, working with, with Whit Diffie, who was a research assistant at the AI lab at Stanford. And when Diffie and Hellman saw this, this note, um, they immediately recognized what was going on and sort of the immensity of the, uh, the, the idea that Merkel had had. And they did one, they sort of made one tweak to it that turned out to be incredibly important and incredibly useful. So the one innovation that Diffie and Hellman came up with is they came up with a protocol that would allow Alice and Bob sort of to do something like k cubed work. So k is going to be the length of the secret key you're going to agree on. But the eavesdropper now needs to do like 2 to the k work, 2 to the you know, k over 2, something like that. So the gap now between the work that Alice and Bob need to do and the work that the eavesdropper needs to do is now exponential. So instead of n and n squared, we have you know, polynomial time and exponential time. So this is, this is what makes it really, really practical, even for computers back then. Um, and I think just because of time, I'm going to skip through the protocol. Uh, but you can ask me afterwards if you want to know how it works. Um, but, but the main point is now in this world of ATMs and banks, basically everyone can use this Diffie-Hellman key exchange to immediately establish shared secrets with anyone else in the world who they've never talked to before. Um, so 
it's hard to, to overstate the importance of this development in the world of cryptography. And this is really why um, I think we divide the world, in, or the history of crypto at least, into 1976 uh, and say before is like dark ages and after is, is the world we live in now. Um, so what did they do? They, they wrote up their idea in, in a, a really nice paper that's also fun to read um, and published it in an international you know, I, IEEE journal. It was distributed around the world. Um, right, so that was the first, that was, that was my bit of technical history. Um, and I want to talk now about what happened after they published that paper and what, what, it, what events it, it triggered. Um, so, so in particular, uh, you know, what, what, what was going on inside the NSA when this happened? What, what, how were people reacting? So I think it's fair to say that people who were working on crypto in the government were uh, horrified when this, this paper was published. And the reason they were horrified is because, you know, this IEEE paper was sent out to people in the Soviet Union, to people in Europe, to people in Latin America. I mean, it was all of a sudden these, these very heavy crypto ideas were being distributed around the world. And in fact, um, an NSA history that's recently been declassified um, says that NSA regarded this technique, this Diffie-Hellman key exchange technique, as classified, and now it's out in the open. So, so whether you, this sort of implies that they knew about this technique before, whether you believe that or not is not so important to me. But the, the, the bottom line is just that um, you know, these techniques that they really were trying to keep secret are now being published in, in journals that anyone can read. Um, so it turns out the NSA, you know, no one from the NSA, as far as I know, contacted Diffie and Hellman directly to complain. Uh, what did happen, though, is that sort of after, uh, so this was in November 1976, there was a conference that was to be held uh, the following year in 1977, at which a bunch of people were going to come from around the, the country to present results on, on crypto. Uh, and a couple months before that conference happened, Diffie and Hellman got this letter from a guy named J.A. Meyer. Um, that was basically a sort of veiled threats uh, and accusations that, that what they were doing was tantamount to uh, arms export and violated all these regulations. You don't have to read the whole thing, but basically they, they've been violating a bunch of federal laws and you're, you're putting yourself at risk of prosecution by publishing results on crypto. Um, and the thing that really raised people's eyebrows was that he was from Bethesda, Maryland, which is like right next door to, uh, to Fort Meade. And it later turned out, um, Science Magazine confirmed, uh, I, think by, I think this was by a phone book, um, that Meyer was actually an NSA employee. So, so this was, this was uh, sort of terrifying, I think, to these academics because it, it, even though he wasn't acting in his official capacity, getting this, this letter from an NSA employee um, saying that you're violating federal laws by publishing your research was sort of, uh, you know, made, made them think. So, so even though Meyer wasn't, wasn't you know, wasn't a emailing them as, or writing them, I should say, as a government official, he raised uh, an important question in his letter that I think no one had really thought about much before, um, which is, you know, can the federal government prevent academics from publishing their crypto research? Um, is crypto sort of so, so uh, vital to national security that it should be sort of kept, kept secret? And I think it's easy in retrospect to say, well, you know, of course not. We have a f the First Amendment, First Amendment rights say we can, you know, we have freedom of speech and freedom of expression. So, of course, we should be able to publish our research results. Um, but I think that, you know, uh, isn't, doesn't quite capture uh, what actually happened and what, what, what the law actually says. So, in, in fact, there are laws. So, the Atomic Energy Act of 1954 is one um, that basically prohibit you from publishing research about certain, certain things. So, so, design and manufacture of nuclear weapons, even if you've, uh, you know, can, uh, come up with that information on your own without any access to confidential materials. You know, if you sit in your basement and come up with something that's covered under this act, you're not uh, allowed to publish it in, in, a, in a journal without pre-publication review. So I don't think it's obvious that, that crypto, you know, went the way it did, such that we can all publish our papers without having to ask anyone. I think there's, there's a good argument to be made that something like, you know, the, the you know, Cryptographic Security Act of, you know, 1977 could have happened and we, we would not be talking, uh, I would not certainly be giving this presentation uh, today. So the, the sort of, this is one way you can get stuff uh, sort of made secret. Uh, I'm going to talk, just give you a, a taste of the different legal arguments you could imagine would apply to this situation, why crypto might be sort of kept secret. Um, so this is one, the Atomic Energy Act of 1954. Of course, it doesn't mention crypto anywhere in the act. So it's not really uh, conceivable that you could use this to, to classify crypto stuff. 
This is interesting, actually. Has anyone heard of the Invention Secrecy Act? OK, this is, uh, yeah, OK, good one. Uh, so it turns out if you uh, file uh, a patent application on something that hasn't been published yet, uh, and someone, uh, the commissioner of patents, decides that publishing this thing uh, would be sort of detrimental to national security in a very vaguely defined way, um, they can stake a secrecy order on your patent application and on your idea, and you are not allowed to, to uh, publish it or sort of disseminate that information indefinitely. And it turns out, actually, there's about 5,500 patents uh, I looked up this morning that are currently covered under this act. So, you know, if, if Diffie and Hellman hadn't, uh, had gotten unlucky and had filed for a patent before they published their paper, uh, I don't know, maybe we might not have heard about it. So that's good to know about. Um, national security information um, is, is information that's covered under a series of executive orders issued by, you know, presidents from the 1950s up to now. Um, and these are the things that the, the executive orders that establish sort of classified information as, as we sort of usually know it. So secret, top secret, uh, this sort of thing. But that inf those executive orders really only cover information that's produced by the federal government or agents of the federal government. So if you sit in your basement and cook up some idea, uh, it doesn't seem likely that uh, it's going to fall under any of these, these uh, executive orders. And it doesn't seem like anyone can make an argument that what you're doing is classified. Um, and the last thing, the last sort of way you get something uh, restricted in the U.S., or you could imagine, would be if it fell under uh, the ITAR regulations or the tr arms trafficking rules. Um, and these rules cover t a huge number of things, but they also, they specifically cover cryptographic devices. Um, and these are in effect even now. Uh, so you, you can't export certain sorts of uh, cryptographic devices without a license. Um, but it's not clear, at least at the time it wasn't, and, and, and now it's sort of more clear that this would apply to speech. So you could imagine you know, it's, it's not okay to export a cryptographic device, but it's okay to give a speech about the design of such a cryptographic device. Um, but, but this is what I think uh, Hellman in particular was worried about, that, that giving a speech in a foreign country would constitute export of, of cryptographic uh, technology. So these are the arg arguments you could imagine uh, a federal prosecutor making if they were trying to keep crypto out of the, the public eye. Um, and when Hellman got this Meyer letter, he, he knew that this conference was coming up and his students were giving talks at this conference. And he, he started to worry, oh no, are my students going to get arrested at this conference for giving these talks? Like, that would not be good, right? Uh, hard to get a PhD when you're in prison. Um, so he wrote to Stanford's general counsel asking for advice. Um, and in the memo he wrote, um, he made a couple arguments for why crypto research should be public. Um, and I think so the first argument he makes uh, really nicely, and I've actually, I'll, again, linked here, and I'll, I'll post the slides, um, is that sort of the lack of commercial-grade uh, commercial crypto or crypto and commercial products is itself a national security threat. Um, and the reason is because Hellman saw all of our data is going into, into computers. All of our intellectual properties is in computers. All of our health information is going to be in computers. And if this stuff isn't secured properly, we're going to have a national security problem. No matter how you define national security, some bad stuff is going to happen. Um, so this is the first argument he made. And he made a couple of other arguments that I don't know if they're um, sort of as convincing, but, but he, he argued that basically any country now with computers can build cryptographic tools. So we shouldn't really worry so much about export uh, because this is going to happen anyways. And finally, he wanted to sort of rebut the arguments that, that people in the government were making that crypto, sort of the U.S. advantage in crypto was really important in World War II. And he, he, he says, well, we're not at war anymore. So I'm not sure that this, this applies. So, uh, right. So this letter was sent to John Schwartz, who was Stanford's general counsel at the time. And Schwartz right back, writes back and says, uh, basically, you know, uh, we agree with you, but there's always a risk uh, that you'll get fined or imprisoned if the government prevails in a case against you. So, you know, we believe you. We believe that, you know, what you're doing is okay. But uh, if, you know, if the government disagrees with you, then, then you might have a problem. So, so what happens? Uh, so Hellman is faced with this decision and, you know, this difficult sort of dilemma about whether he should give the talks or not. So, or his students should give the talks or not. And, and like any good PhD advisor, he turns around to his students and said, ah, you decide. Uh, so, so he actually told the students, you, you decide whether you want to give the talks or not and risk, risk getting arrested. And of course, the students, uh, being gung-ho PhD students, said, yeah, yeah, of course we'll give the talks. Um, and then they called their parents and said, hey, we're going to give these talks. We might get arrested. And 
uh, their parents actually talked them out of it, as, as Hellman tells it. So in the end, uh, the students didn't give the talks. Hellman gave the talks, uh, that, so he was the professor. And the students st stood on the stage uh, mute. And you know, he said it was, is, it was quite dramatic, right? Because everyone in the audience could sort of see that the, the weight of uh, potential prosecution was, was actually causing, causing these students to be silenced. And it made uh, for a very dramatic, dramatic event and got a lot of favorable press coverage. Uh, so in particular, so this, this was something uh, in science and the journal Science after, after the, uh, the meeting in 1977. And basically, the, the event went smoothly. So no one got arrested, no one got fined. Um, and since then, pretty much, crypto research, there's been no question um, as far as anyone. I mean, I, I've asked a bunch of researchers, have you ever thought about, you know, thought twice about publishing your work? And the people I've talked to have all said they've never, never thought about it. Um, it's, it's basically accepted now that crypto research can be published without asking anyone. Um, and if you're interested in this story in more detail, you can read the Stanford Magazine piece. So in the, in the last couple of minutes, I'd like to sort of address this question. Like, is this the, was, there, was this the happy ending? Like, did we you know, live happily ever after now that, now that everyone can publish crypto research uh, without asking the federal government for, for permission? Or more, sort of more generally, what's the lesson that we take away from this story? Um, and there's a few different ways to read this, this, this piece of history. Um, so one way to read the piece of history is, is captured by the title of this book by Stephen Levy. So the title is Crypto, How the Code Rebels Beat the Government, Saving Privacy in the Digital Age. Uh, of course, published 2001, which is before all the Snowden stuff came out. Um, but I think, I mean, this is, this is actually a really wonderful book that you should read if you're interested in this history. But this is a horrible title. Um, it's a horrible title, I think, uh, for a couple of reasons. First, I don't think it's true that our privacy in the digital age was saved nor do I think that the code rebels beat the government, but I think it also sort of is simplifies in a way that's not, not really helpful. Uh, but, but you should read the book anyways if you're interested, because it's a wonderful, wonderful book. So, so, so to my mind, one of the lessons, at least from this story, um, is, that, is that the NSA leadership uh, at the time, and I think that the NSA leadership, even though it's obviously changed many times, uh, has sort of learned this lesson in a very painful way for them, that it can't win the debate in public. Uh, so, so this issue about whether the researchers could publish their papers took place in, in, in newspapers. Um, so the New York Times covered it, for example. Science covered it. It got a lot of publicity, and it got a lot of people upset. It's you know, this guy, Meyer, who was threatening, threatening these sort of quirky scientists and grad students. Um, so my sense is that the reaction on the part of people um, working in the federal government on crypto was, was not sort of to throw up their hands and say, OK, you know, now crypto's out there, everyone gets to use it. It was more that, I mean, because I still think they really felt that um, their mission, the, their ability to, to, um, to achieve their mission was, was at risk by, by the proliferation of crypto tools. So I think what they did was to sort of shift, shift their um, techniques a bit to, to techniques that were sort of more subtle and, and less in the public eye. What, what do I mean exactly by that? Um, so so if, you're, if you're worried that, you know, your enemy is going to be encrypting all of uh, her communications and you're not going to be re able to read any of them, uh, you're going to want to sort of modify the crypto systems that people are using in such a way that that, that doesn't happen. Uh, but but wh what I mean even more generally than that is like think about how a crypto system gets to market. So how, how does it get from uh, you know, an idea in someone's head into your browser, into your computer? And there are actually a bunch of steps that, that, that happen here. One of the key steps um, that, that I was talking about just now is sort of going from a research idea into a research publication. So this is an important step. This is what Diffie and Hellman did. They came up with a research idea, and then they published it. Uh, but this is not the only step, right? This is not in your browser. Um, so so another, another sort of key piece of the, the supply chain here is funding. So if you want to do research, you need funding, especially if you're in a university. And who funds crypto research, or actually any research in, in the US? It's, it's the federal government. Um, in particular, computer science research is funded, the bulk of it, uh, at least as far as I know, is funded by the federal government and, and agencies of the Defense Department. So if you want to influence what people are working on, funding is a very effective way to do it. And it's also, there's not a lot of public scrutiny, right? Because uh, if, you're, if your application for a grant gets denied, it's not really clear. They don't have to tell you why, necessarily. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Of course, another one is once you've published, uh, 
publish the thing in a journal, it needs to get into national and international standards, right? So uh, federal agencies have a huge influence on what gets standardized. Um, NIST obviously writes, writes the standards, but there's other organizations uh, like ISO uh, in which the, the agencies of the federal government have a large say. Um, so that's another thing to think about, and there's other things too. So, so you need to implement your stuff on, on some hardware. Uh, it needs to get adopted, say, into your browser. And one way, another way that sort of, uh, the you know, Defense Department influences what gets adopted is by setting their procurement policies. So if they say, we're only going to buy computers that support Cypher Suite X, everyone is going to support Cypher Suite X because everyone wants to sell to the def Defense Department. Um, so, so I guess my, my point is that we shouldn't focus all of our energy here. Like, this is really cool that now we can publish whatever research we want basically on crypto, but there is like a much bigger picture, and you could even extend this diagram out in all sorts of different ways. Um, and so I, I guess to focus just here is, is to lose, uh, sort of lose perspective on, on what it really means to implement a crypto system or what it really means to deploy a crypto system in practice. Um, so... so I guess that's, this is one of the lessons I take away, is that we should look at, look at the bigger picture, define the picture more broadly. So I'll end with, with uh, one piece of good news, or at least maybe promising, hopeful, hopeful news, at least to me. Um, and this, is, this, this was in response to a question I asked uh, Bobby Ray Inman, who was the director of the NSA in the late 1970s and early 1980s, when this was all going on. And I asked him, if you were going to go back and change the way you were interacting with, with academic cryptographers, what would you do differently? Um, and his response was this. He said, rather than being careful to make sure that we weren't uh, going to damage our collection capabilities, so our intelligence gathering capabilities, I would have been interested in how quickly they, meaning the academic cryptographers, would have been able to make crypto systems available in a form that would protect proprietary information as well as government information. So at least the way I read that is that, you know, after 40-some after years, uh, or I guess just under, um, Bobby Ray Inman, who was directing NSA at the time, realized sort of what Martin Hellman realized in 1977, which is that the lack of crypto implemented properly um, in all of the computer systems we use is now becoming itself a national security threat. Um, and so at least for sort of a piece of it, um, I see sort of an aligning of incentives for, for people who are interested in getting good crypto deployed in, in real systems and the people who are in charge of, of sort of setting, setting uh, implementing at least uh, policy at the federal level uh, with respect to crypto. So that's, if there's a piece of hopeful news or something, something good to come out of this story, that's uh, is what sort of, that's, that's what I think it is. So just before I finish, I'd like to say, uh, if you're interested in any of this stuff, there's a few things I, I'd highly recommend you read. So these are three great books on the history. Um, and Martin Hellman's papers are also at Stanford in, in the archives, and they're open to the public. So if you want to go dig through old papers about crypto, it's sort of fun to go look at his old research notes and things. Um, and then, of course, I have to mention my advisor's uh, courses on crypto. So the Stanford courses are all open if you want to go walk in and watch class, uh, watch the classes. And there's also these great uh, Coursera courses. So Crypto 1 is already online, and Dan tells me that Crypto 2 is coming out soon. So if you're interested, you took Crypto 1 and you liked it, there's supposed to be a second one uh, uh, soon, for soon for two years, yeah. So, so uh, I asked him. I asked him, Dan, like, when are you going to finish the course? And he says he's record. He's in the studio recording it now. So, whatever that means. Uh, so, yeah. With that, I'd like to uh, take your questions and uh, thanks for listening. Thank you.